السلام عليكم صباح الخير كل سنه وانتم سالمين جميعا uh, good morning uh, we are transmitting live here from Oman Jordan from Farah Medical uh, Center and uh, the backdrop is a slide showing the map of Jordan we have the Dead Sea and we also have the Red Sea and the place to visit is Petra Wadi Roman Aqaba This is Aqaba, this is Bakasab of Aqaba, the city on the Red Sea, where you can do lots of water sports, and uh, in addition you can do snorkeling, uh, diving, and this is King Abdullah of Jordan, diving in Jordan. That means that my daughter also is uh, keen on uh, this kind of sport, which I cannot, I dare not do it. So we'll discuss the uh, Topic of today, the brainstem lesions, the clinical, radiological, operative, and pathological correlation. Uh, so we have to look at the anatomy of the brainstem. If we look from anterior, anterior view, you will see the brainstem, you will see the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Each is a continent on its own, <coughs> and its anatomy is so, uh, so complex but so easy at the same time. And what kills me is to read a medical or a radiological report saying brain stem is okay. As if you say uh, Asia is okay. You can't say that. You have to be specific about the brain stem. Stop using the brain stem. You have to say midbrain, pons and medulla, each on its own. Of course, most all of the cranial nerves come from the anterior or lateral aspect of the brain stem except one nerve which comes from the back of the brain stem which is the trochlear nerve. Other than that all the cranial nerves, the 12 cranial nerves come from the, to the front. This is a close look at the frontal view. This is the hypothalamus, this is the mammillary bodies, anterior perforated substance, and this is the crust of the brain stem. The crust uh, is part of the brain stem and it carries the uh, pyramidal system, this is the corticospinal tract, and this is the corticopontine tract, and this is the cortico parieto occipital tract. And they are arranged as such. Why I'm saying this? Because this has a bearing on the surgery of uh, the brain stem that we are going to see. <coughs> so, again, close look at the cross cerebri that's carrying the pyramidal system, the, the motor system the front of uh, the pontine, the corticospinal, and the parietal fibers. This knowledge is important. Again here you can see the white matter uh, dissection of that. So midbrain, pons, and middle of lungata, and the clenal nerves coming out of it. A few open a window here, this is cadaver specimen, and then you'll go into the fourth ventricle and you'll see the coral plexus. What if we look from behind, from upstairs of you, by looking at the back of the uh, brainstem, this is the pineal body, this is midbrain, and this is the part of the midbrain which is seen from the back. It's called the tectal plate, uh, and it's made of superior colliculus, Inferior colliculus, superior colliculus, <coughs> inferior colliculus. Each has its own function. And then we'll have the pons, and this is the cerebellar hemispheres. Again, if you dig here, you will come to the fourth ventricle. The floor of the fourth ventricle is this shape two triangles, top triangle and the lower triangle. The top triangle is related to the pons. The lower triangle is related to the open part of the medulla. Medulla is made of two parts, closed part and the open part. Open part because it opens into the fourth ventricle. And there is a line, which you can see here, it's called stria medullaris. That's the line. That divides this into upper triangle and the lower triangle. And here is the facial colliculus. 
Again, this is the floor of the fourth ventricle, the two triangles, <coughs> and the upper triangle and the lower triangle, strain medullaris, that's a great both. And here in this spot is the facial colliculus. And I'll come back to that. Uh, the weakness point of any doctor is the neurology. And the weakness point in any neurology is the brainstem. It looks so complex, but when you understand it, it's so easy. The thing is that just to dig deep into understanding it. When you look at this, you say, I don't, I don't want to hear about it. So complex. So let's make it easy. There are, parameters, there are the nuclei of the cranial nerves. And here is this. It's some motor ones, and these are the sensory ones. Again, it looks like complex, but it is not. If you know, start with one and then build it on, then you will, uh, it will be easy. So I will do that with you. Uh, step by step. This is the cut section of the floor of the fourth ventricle, and this is the median sulcus, this is the stria medullaris, this is pons, this is medulla, this is the open part of the medulla, the closed part of the medulla, and here we have the nucleus of the abducent nerve. And these are the fibers of the facial nerve going around the nucleus of the sixth nerve. So what we say is a facial colliculus is not the facial nucleus. These are the fibers of the facial nerve going around the sixth nerve nucleus. Nevertheless, if you go there, you will damage both. So let's look at the brainstem from the top. Uh, this is the tentorium, separating supratentorial part from the inframentorial part. <coughs> this is the midbrain coming through the hiatus within the tent. Is somebody talking on the phone or somebody? <coughs> here we have removed one leaf of the tent, here the same. Both of them we are looking at the superior surface of the cerebellum. Cerebellum has three surfaces. This is one of them. It's called tentorial surface because it is towards the tent. And then we have a surface here towards the petrous bone called petrous uh, surface. And we have a surface related to the occipital bone, and this is the called occipital. Excuse me, anybody who wants to talk, please leave. I don't like people talking. Either I talk or you talk. Still talking. This is disrespect for the speaker. Sagittal cuts will show you the brainstem, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. So you cannot speak about brainstem. You have to speak about each and every one. A radiological report should speak about midbrain, pons, and medulla, each on its own. It's the easiest thing is to teach a resident in radiology about brain radiology. Ventricular systems are okay. Brain parenchyma is okay. No aneurysm, no EMS. That's the report I hear and I read. And this is ridiculous. If one of these reports go abroad, they will say that we are retarded. Again, the tracts within the brainstem looks also very complex. Let's make it easy. Very complex, looks very complex, very busy. The easy thing is to think about it this way. The tracts, the longer tracts, they travel in the anterior part of the brainstem, whether midbrain or pons or medulla. Or the, the uh, nuclei of the cranial nerves, they lie to the back. So in the back of the brain stem here, you will find cranial nerve nuclei. and the anterior part here, you will find the lung tracts. So the best way to reach the brain stem is lateral. You will avoid the, the lung tracts. You will avoid the cranial nerve nuclei. Let's look at the transverse cuts. And here is the complexity. It's not complex. This is the crust. This is midbrain. This is the crust of the midbrain. Contains the corticospinal tract in the middle, the corticopontine, the, the corticopontine part, and the uh, parietal occipital part. This is substantia nigra. <coughs> this is red nucleus. This is medial laminiscus of the. Uh, sensation, 
and this is the spinal thalamic of the pain. This is Edinger with spinal nucleus of the third nerve, medial and cuticular fasciculus, central segmental tract. It's the same replica. The third nerve comes from its nucleus and goes to the front, while the, uh, the trochlear comes this way and goes from the back. Why am I saying this? Because we're talking about brain stem surgery. So where is the lesion? Depends and shows the anatomy. How do I deal with this one, which is coming from posterior? Or this one coming lateral? Or this one coming from anterior? So I have to have the knowledge of these tracts to be able to do brain stem surgery. This is the cut section of the pons. Again, seems to be complex. Again, it is not. Anterior part are the pyramidal tracts, the long tracts, and behind is the uh, cranial nerve nuclei. Same thing. <coughs> the lesion will decide which way to go by anatomy decision. Again, here I refer back to the so-called facial calculus. We are looking at the floor of the fourth ventricle, this is the nucleus of the sixth nerve, this is the nucleus of the seventh nerve. Why seventh nerve goes this way, goes this way, and comes this way? Why should it come this way? It's the explanation for this, it's called chemotactic uh, theory, which I don't want to dwell about, but it's a very mysterious kind of theory. But this is the facial nerve fibers going like this. If you go into the facial colliculus, which is the facial fibers going around the sixth nerve nucleus, you will damage sixth nerve and seventh nerve. A section of the modella, the closed part and the open part, this is the open part. So again, still the pyramidal system is in the front and the cranial nerves are in the back. Again, where the lesion and the pons on the modella defines which way to go. So, we know some about brainstem anatomy. Let's see what happens to the brainstem in terms of pathology. What are the brainstem lesions that we see? Uh, one of the commonest things that you see are the gliomas. And this is called thalamo mesencephalic. Mesencephalic means midbrain. Between the thalamus and the midbrain. Thalamo mesencephalic. This is midbrain, also going into the thalamus. This is tictal plate of the midbrain. This is tegmental part of the midbrain. This is the brachypontis of the midbrain. And this is the open part of the medulla. This is the closed part of the medulla. And this is the spinal cord. So this is midbrain glioma. And it is around the aqueduct. And it's called periaqueductal glioma. A uh, better name for it is called pencil glioma. Uh, this is again glioma and the upper part of the midbrain. This is a girl whom we operate upon. This is the histology. It was a pilocytic astrocytoma. Very benign lesion. Again, this is the lesion in the back of the midbrain. And again, it was an astrocytoma. And this girl, which we operate upon, and this is the post op and the histology and the follow-up. Uh, this is collection of the pontine gliomas. And whenever you see uh, an arrow or an asterisk, this is not my collection. Uh, this is from uh, uh, an collection. And this is uh, kind of the gliomas that you see. Diffuse, localized, etc. A case of mine, 15 year old. Mind you, brainstem gliomas are usually a disease of children. And this is kind of a glioma in the pons. It's here in front of the pons and the medulla. And it's going out. And we call this exophytic because it is coming out. Exophytic. This are is. Usually or? Most of them are benign, most of them, but some of them are malignant. And the, the point is that benign or malignant, the, the anatomy is malignant. So this is glioblastoma, glioblastoma of the medulla oblongata. Again, this is the exophytic type, so it's coming from the medulla out. 
This is preferred from the other types, which is called intrinsic, which is inside the brainstem. This, if you go this way, you can reach it. While if it is inside, then you have to go through normal uh, brain tissue, no brainstem tissue. So this is a called exophytic type of glioma. And this is called focal type of glioma. This is called diffuse type of glioma. So gliomas are either focal or diffuse or exophytic. Another legion which is common is cavernoma, cavernomas. <coughs> and again, this is a patient of mine, eight-year-old male patient with this midbrain tictal plate. This is tictal plate. This is segmentum of the midbrain. Again, a radiology report should say this. You just cannot say brainstem is normal. Tell me, midbrain and its two parts is normal, pons is normal in its two parts, but then the closed part and the open part is normal. And tell me why this lesion is a glioma, because in D T1 it shows this, in T2 it shows this. So a report should be elaborate and not three lines. So this is a cavernoma. This is tegmentum. Not tectal plate, this is tectal plate, this is tegmentum of the midbrain. And again, you can see the lesion. It can be small, it can be large. Pontum is encephalic, it's in the midbrain and in the pons. Pontum is, enc pontum is encephalic. <coughs> and this is totally pontine, in glioma, or covered now, sorry. And this is a collection of pediatric uh, cavernomas. Cavernomas can hit little children, and usually they come with bleed and cranial nerve pulses. Cavernoma of the pons. This is called exophytic. This is good. This is bad. This is intrinsic. To reach it, you have to go through normal tissue. Here, ex extrinsic. If you go to the fourth ventricle, it's, it's good. And this is medulla cavernoma. It is within the medulla. So various types of medullary cavernomas. Hemangioblastomas are common, again, common, common lesion in the posterior fossa in the uh, brainstem. And this is my series of hemangioblastomas. Some of them, actually, not all of them, have big series of these hemangioblastomas. Uh, they can occur, of course, supratentorial or infratentorial. Commonly in the infratentorial, they come in the cerebellum, but also they can come in the brainstem. The notion that hemangioblastoma is a cystic lesion with an adule is no more. Hemangioblastoma could be totally solid without any cyst. And they could be just sitting on the surface of the brainstem or embedding itself, or it could be totally intrinsic. This is totally solid, no cyst in it. And these are the most difficult. Why? Because they have feeders and they have drainage. They are just like ABM. They are notorious more than ABMs. So you can see, if you do angiogram, you'll see the plush, you'll see the feeders, you'll see the drain veins. It could be a solo legion or it could be part of bone hippolindo disease, where they have multiple hemangioblastomas in the brain and in the spinal cord. Uh, tumors can come to the brainstem from our surrounding structures, and we discuss, discussed this last time, uh, coming from pineal gland or anything else like germinomas or non-germinomas, we discussed this last time. At the end of the day, you will be operating on the brainstem. Epidermoid going into the midbrain. Or a meningioma going into the whole of the brainstem. Or a lipoma like this. Well, again, we discussed this last time in the pineal lesions. And this is a uh, operative uh, photo where you can see the lipoma sitting at the back of the midbrain, and this is the fourth nerve. Other diseases that affect the brainstem, you can get infarct. And then you will wonder, is this an infarct or is this a tumor? Again, whenever you see an arrow, this is not my collection. This is uh, from uh, Anne's book. And this is a picture also of the brainstem infarct due to 
basilar artery uh, involvement. And you can see it's affecting both cerebellum and the uh, brainstem. A hypertensive bleed can present in the brainstem, and you think it's a tumor. Vasculitis. Again, we forgot about these pathologies because we think in one track. What's just one track? Abdominal pain, appendicitis, ovarian cysts. We forgot about all pathology. Sinuses, tonsils, and that's it. We stop thinking at that level. These diseases exist. There are patients with Bajet disease and lobus coming with vasculitis. Vasculitis is an ocean of diseases. <coughs> Don't fall, please. Encephalitis. Again, our neurologists in the audience would appreciate these pictures. Encephalitis. There is a, an entity called brainstem encephalitis that comes just in the brainstem and it needs a special EEG to, to show it. Deep electrode EEG. Acute disseminated encephalomyelopathy, ADM, acute disseminated encephalomyelopathy, affecting the brainstem and the spinal cord. Encephalitis <coughs> due to HIV. Do you see this often, Allah? Oh, no, not often. Not often. When you see enough HIV, you see it. It's, it's, it's done. So it can, can also present like this. Very key encephalopathy. Korsakoff syndrome. Dr. Mamoun, I've seen you in the audience. Do you see any of these cases? Yeah, no. No, but yes, in the but States you do. States, uh, Why is that? They drink more. That's because of alcohol, yes, thank you. People here drink too, but not as much as. Osmotic demyelination syndrome. This is very important in pediatric uh, group. Aneurysm. Aneurysm, is this aneurysm? Yes, this is a viable, alive aneurysm. This is a thrombose aneurysm. It looks like a tumor. So people, uh, like in the insurance companies, they don't want you to do angiogram. Why should you do angiogram? Why should you do CBC? You just get the patient the same day. Why should you admit him before? MS. MS is famous. Seven to nine lesions periventricular in the spinal cord and in the brainstem. Female, young. Brain abscess, infection. Tuberculomas, tuberculitis of the brainstem. Again, we forgot about these diseases. We practice with one wheel. Sarcoidosis. So pathology of the brainstem is massive. What about the images? May I comment here? May I comment here? Yeah, of course. Um, morning and Happy New Year. Um, this is really important. These are actual cases that you've seen. Um, these are not hypothetical uh, 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 brain exercise. <clears throat> um, and I cannot emphasize the importance of this further. Um, um, sarcoid can happen in the brainstem <clears throat> and this can be masked by giving this patient steroids and just wait upon them and I've seen this happen this is a very rare occurrence but it can happen and when you give patients steroids with a, with a presentation like this and they have tuberculoma uh, you're going to kill these patients uh, uh, the same would apply to brain abscesses uh, MS lesions that happen in the brainstem without anything else also would be masked by steroids these patients often would be mismanaged by giving them steroids. The lesion would improve, and things would be buried uh, below the uh, uh, beneath the carpet, and then they will come back with a vengeance and die. Um, um, I can't really emphasize this enough. And uh, when you see enough of HIV, you're going to definitely see this. But uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, this is uh, here, though it is underreported. Um, I want just to mention a few other things that that will have. Um, uh, uh, severe implications upon the management here. Can meningiomas happen in the brainstem as, as Dr. Brahim? Definitely they can. Germinoma, that's really important because if you miss that diagnosis and you bury the diagnosis with radiotherapy because you term them, you label them as brainstem lesions that are non biopsible you are missing a potentially curable uh, a malignancy. The primary CNS germ cell tumors can happen in the brainstem and they're cured with platinum-based 
hormones uh, 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 to be followed by consolidation radiotherapy. <coughs> um, uh, hemangioblastomas uh, can can happen here as well. And I want to mention a few other lesions that will have uh, a definite uh, um, uh, 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 implication on management. Now, the presumption in most of these cases that these are brain stem gliomas and they are managed as the uh, as such with radiotherapy alone. Now, granted, a lot of these patients will have brain stem gliomas, which is one of the most common diagnoses in this uh, in this region. <coughs> Now, the reason why we emphasize these points, I'm sorry. Why do you always refer to the fact that is, is steroids a standard treatment? You always say they're the not standard treatment. Unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately, I cannot tell you how frequent this malpractice is. It seems. You'll get a patient with brain stem lesion. Uh, somebody will tell them, oh, this is in the brainstem, we cannot get tissue diagnosis. Give them steroids, give them radiotherapy, send away. I cannot tell you how many times we have this, and I, in, in meetings, I continue to bang on the table, for God's sake, I need tissue diagnosis. Now, granted, there are cases that the tissue diagnosis is going to be very difficult to get. But there's a difference between an expert neurosurgeon like Professor Sbeh telling me that I can't get you anything and a mediocre surgeon telling me I can't get you anything and just give steroids and central radiotherapy. These are the, the examples I continue to hammer unfortunately happen every single day. Not only that, the steroids are given to the region, they are given to the structures. I have seen doctors and neurologists and other people giving just a steroid for a disc graft and just waiting him until they develop foot to drop and then they refer him. There is a lot of malpractice in the third world, a lot, and a lot of mediocre internists and mediocre radiologists and mediocre neurosurgeons. We have to face this if we want to get along and progress further. We have to admit that we have a malpractice which is very infectious in this in this uh, kind of part of the world. I'll just proceed with that. I want to add CBM. I see a lot of CBM. Yes. That, that gives steroids. Yes, of course. CBM. Lots. Yes. Lots. Because he's a mediocre and he doesn't know what to do, so they give steroids. <coughs> Again, to stress that brainstem, because Dr. Jarir just stepped in, brainstem is a territory whereby a lot of pediatric uh, population get uh, involved. So back to the images, CT scan could show you a hemorrhage, it could show you the lesion itself, and here in this specific CT, you'll see something peculiar that a lot, very few people think about, so-called Developmental venous anomaly. It's very important, I'll come to it. MRI, of course, T2 is very good to show cavernomas, for example. The gradient echo is very important to show the hemorrhage. And we have four types of the cavernomas zebra musky type 1, zebra musky type 2, 3, and 4. Again, this is an area where very few people know, where very few people would ask. I would love to put such a picture for a resident who is sitting for the exam and I tell you, no one would answer it, though they should know it. But their teachers don't teach it because they don't know it. The anatomy of the venous system, as if it does not exist. Venous system is nothing. The artists are important. Venous system is very important in every part of the body, especially in the brain. We have to know these means. And you'll be blamed for asking them difficult questions. Ah, they would say the skull-based surgeon asking us, it happened. They complain against me asking about the carotid artery. So here you see, you can see the uh, vein of Rosenthal, starting of the central veins, internal uh, cerebral veins, and so on. A new development in MRI, and our audiologist would agree, is the diffusion tensor imaging or cytography, where you can see the long tracts. Mm, you'll see the medial lemniscus, you'll see the corticospinal tract, the medial lemniscus in 3D. That would help you to 
uh, start, what kind of approach would I do? And what is the relation of these important tracts uh, in the management? If you affect the corpiplegia, if you affect the, uh, the uh, medial meniscus or the uh, spinal thalamic, then it is hemianesthesia and so on. So you can see these tracts on the tractography, the long tract and the inferior cerebellar peduncle. As I said, not only you see the tracts, but you see a relationship with the legion. And each color code means something. Well, I'm not going to dwell on that. But once you know it, it's easy. Look at this example, which is a right front to oblique right front of oblique view. The uh, verbal is the corticospinal tract and the pink is the uh, medial meniscus of the uh, sensory tract. You can see the relationship with the legion. This is a radiologist. This is, yes. It is, yes. This is a Tractography, yes. How can we do diffusion? We have, we have, yes. Is this diffusion? Yes. How recent is this technique? For how long have we been using it? It's been for years. Ten years. Ten years? Yeah. yeah. We have it, has it? Uh, I think some machines, they have the capability to, to do it, but there are not yeah. ten machines. Do you have it for Medina Kuntumusin? Yes, yes. 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 How do you select each, each tract? How can you select this tract? There is this is a technique that you can show the motor tracks and the sensory tracks. Look at this here again. <coughs> and this, for example. It's beautiful. Look at this. Here you can see the legion, you can see the spinal thalamic, and you can see that this is affected. Medial meniscus is infiltrated on this side, while on this side it's okay. I'll show you this uh, quick video. Now we'll go into the surgery of the brainstem. And this is an uh, introductory uh, kind of video. Safe entry zones to the brainstem. <coughs> the brainstem is a complex part of the brain which controls many functions and may be impacted by various pathologies. Here we see a cutaway view with the cerebellum removed that shows the dorsal brain stem. The cranial nerves and their tracts and nuclei are revealed within in this ghosted section. Approaches to the brain stem make use of various safe entry zones, which are areas of the brain stem that can be traversed with relative ease with less risk of damaging normal brain stem function. These areas are depicted using colored lines and shapes for the midbrain, pawns, and the medulla on the ventral, lateral, and dorsal surfaces. There are a variety of critical entry zones for each region, including for the midbrain, the midline, paracolicular, and lateral mesencephalic zones, and the interbrunicular and perioculomotor safe entry zones. At the level of the pons, there are supratrigeminal, middle, cerebellar, peduncle, and peritrigeminal entry zones. At the level of the medulla, we can see all of our entry zones and lateral and dorsal entry zones into the medulla. The dorsal entry zones are depicted here. <coughs> Use of these entry zones avoids critical structures which otherwise may be damaged. These safe entry zones are optimally used for lesions that are not close to a peel or appendable surface. In cases where a lesion abuts a peel or appendable surface, it is usually best to approach the lesion directly by expanding the area where it comes to the surface most closely. Careful study of these entry zones will provide the surgeon with an armamentarium of approaches to most areas of the brain stem. Facility with use of these safe entry zones gives the surgeon the ability to offer patients treatment for what otherwise might seem to be inaccessible lesions. Uh, this was a, a film that was made by Professor Spitzler from Baum Neuroscience Institute. Uh, Spitzler visited Jordan many times, and he's a Jordan friend. Uh, so we'll elaborate on what we have seen to put it into practice. Let's let's have a look. Surgical approaches to the brainstem are many. I will 
explain each and every one of these uh, cases, but there is a, a sort of theory about it. This lesion is in the midbrain, this is the cross cerebri, which means that we are dealing with the pyramidal tract, the corticospinal, corticopantine, corticoparietal. And this is the lesion just there in the cross cerebri. Which way to approach it? It's called two points. The deepest point, the most superficial point, and then you pass it and you say, well, this is the best approach. But here in the pons, for example, this is the point and this is where it comes to the surface. If you come this way, you will damage the pyramidal tract. So you will come this way. So there is a sort of modification that you want to do to decide which approach you want to do. Let's see the anterior approaches. And one of these is the fronto or zygomatic fronto or zygomatic. So that you can reach to the cross cerebri. You can go this way and you can go to the cross cerebri, like the region we have seen. Here, you know that you can go between this and this. This is the corticoparietal, this is corticospinal, so you can go through this. This is one known approach for that. So, you want to go here, in this area. Frontoparietal to the corticospinal, you can go in here. Or you can go in other uh, places. But this is anterior view. So again, this is the cross cerebri, this is the region that I described, it is in the cross cerebri, but if you go this way, between here and here, then you are safe. You cannot do this unless you know the anatomy. So this is the anterior mesenchephalic zone, to go this way. This MRI is your best mapping Absolutely. System. And if you have tractography, that would be good. With your anatomical knowledge, that adds. With your ex surgical experience, that adds up. So brainstem is not a place for the beginners or the novices or the mediocres. So here you can go through the uh, front orbital zygomatic. You can come to the side of the brainstem here. This is a carotid anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, and so on. So you can see, like you go for basal aneurysm. And this is kind of lesions that you deal with this you know, uh, kind of ap approach. It's anterior here. So you study that and then you do. Again, a front orbital because you are anterior lesion. You go between the superior cerebellar and posterior cerebral arteries, where the third nerve comes off the front of the brainstem. Also, for one of the anterior uh, approaches is to go through the ventricles. Uh, so this lesion is the, in the midbrain, and if you approach this through the ventricle by going into between the two internal cerebral veins, like this, you can remove it. Uh, sometimes you use endoscopy, and endoscopy is the future of neurosurgery. I advise my residents to go and have endoscopy training. It is the future of surgery. Here is the transoral but this is completely anterior in the pons. Either you do prepontine, which is complex, or you go directly transoral, and that's the view you'll see. You'll see the basal arch in front of you. You will go and remove the legion. Not easy, but possible. Uh, another view is to go lateral to the brainstem. Not here, the anterior, you go lateral. It's called lateral mesenchephalic sulcus. There is a sulcus here. And there's a vein here, it's called lateral mesenchephalic vein. And then you can go through that safely. Again, just remind you of the anatomy. If you know this cut, you know that you can go in here. You can know that you can go in here. You know that you can go in here. So this is the vein of the lateral mesenchephalic sulcus, and you go in here. It says you are behind the cross, so totally, completely behind the cross between substantia nigra, which is this, and the medial lamniscus. So you can go and do it safely. And this is what we are saying, the lateral mesenchephalic sulcus. Lateral. Also lateral to the pons is that, is, if this is the trigeminal nerve, you can go above it, supra trigeminal, or peri in front of it, or underneath it, between the trigeminal and the facial, laterally. So, again, this is safe area to go through. 
there it is between the trigeminal and the facial, trigeminal and facial, above it, anterior tet, and there it is, trigeminal facial. So this area, the lateral area of the brain stem and the medulla. Again, here is the cavernoma, and you know your anatomy. You will avoid the corticospinal tract, which is anterior. You will avoid the cranial nerve nuclei, which is posterior. You will go between the trigeminal nerve and the facial nerve safely. And this is the cut section where, where you can go. So you can go this way, as I said, laterally. It's again anatomy knowledge. How many of medical students in the world knows this? No. How many of the neurosurgical neurological students know this? Very, very few. And how many of the practicing surgeons? Very, 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 very few. Hence, the, uh, most of the uh, agents in the actual world in these locations are termed inaccessible. Absolutely, and they say glioma, sent for the therapy, without any, without any. <coughs> this is the Modella Langata. Again, here is the anterior review, pyramid and olive. You can go so-called anterior and lateral, anterior lateral uh, sulcus, like this. So one of the lesions that like this, that you want to approach. We can use the lithrosigmoid approach. So you take the brain stem this way and then you go into the brain stem and find it. But this is rather easy if you if you understand what I'm saying. It's not easy. But because it is presenting to the surface. So you'll see it. The, the difficult ones are the ones that are located inside, so called intrinsic ones. <coughs> this one is massive, affecting most of the midbrain. So what should you do? You do pre sigmoid approach. Pre-sigmoid means in front of the sigmoid. We all know the literal sigmoid behind, but the pre-sigmoid is a skull-based uh, approach that very few can master. <coughs> you can, can go through a small triangle here. This is on the left side. You are taking the ear this way, and this is the mastoid here being drilled. This is sigmoid, so you go pre-sigmoid. <laughs> and this is the way to do it on the left side. This is the Anatomy, this is middle fossa, this is posterior fossa, you go through this. It's a very important approach, but it needs a lot of uh, categoric courses and then practicing. And this is what it is. You just cannot go this way. It's difficult, because the region is here. You can't go this way and this way. So what you do is to remove this and then go this way. That's the idea. Pre-sigmoid approach. It is not on the surface. It is intrinsic. It's more difficult. But to do this approach, you would actually go exactly where the lesion is. Subtemporal approach. Left side. Open the dura, retract the temporal loop, and you come to the brain stem, upper brain stem. You may cut the tent, and then you go to the pons. So you can reach to places to do that. And this is uh, one case of subtemporal transtentorial, a legion. And this is transpetrosal kawasset uh, approach for a um, pontine legion, like this one. Or you can go, this is the transfer sinus, was the superior sinus coming this way, transfer sinus, transfer sinus. And this is the occipital sinus, for example. And then you can go in the midline, course median, or you go lateral to it, paramedian, you go far lateral or extreme lateral. And this gives you different views of the back and the lateral side of the brainstem. This is what you see in the median, the paramedian, and the extreme. So if you are interested in this part, you'll go extreme lateral. Interested in this part, you'll go median. Median, paramedian, far lateral or extreme lateral. That's above or below the tent. Median, that's it. That's the picture. You'll see severe colocus, inferior colocus. So you're directly on the back of the midbrain. We have shown you this previously in our film of the pineal tumors. So you open this, you go above the uh, cerebellum, you'll come to this, what we call the shark view. And then, like in this case of mine, 
We are taking the cerebellum down, we are underneath the tent, we are at the back of the midbrain and we are taking this lipoma out. Or far lateral, you just tell the patient and then you will see side view of the severe colliculus. And this is an example, it is not in the midline, it is a bit off, so you will use this approach. Or extreme lateral, or far lateral, where the lesion is really far like this. It is not in the midline, it is not lateral, it is far lateral. In this particular case of thalamomysencephalic, you go supratentorial, you cut the tent and you reach to the back of the midbrain and the thalamus. So posterior interviews or posterior approaches, as we said, here is the midbrain, you can go between the two severe colliculi or underneath the inferior colliculi, you are in the midline. This is the lateral mesencephalic which we described. Here is the <coughs> medial sulcus. Medial sulcus here is okay, but here it's not okay. You should not open here. And you look for the facial colliculus. Again, here the midline is okay. And then the anterior lateral and posterior lateral views. This is the uh, hypoglossal triangle and vagal triangle. So, posterior view or the midbrain, lateral approach, and as I said, the anterior approach. So this is the midline, median sulcus. Try to avoid it in most of the times, especially in here. This is the sulcus, and this is the so-called facial colliculus, which as we said is not facial nucleus. These are fibers of the facial nerve coursing around the set nerve nucleus. You go in, you damage both nerves. So you will choose an area above it, or below it, or lateral to it. So this is the median sulcus, and this is the facial colliculus, you go above it or below it. Or you go lateral to it. So here's the, the posterior approaches for the medulla. So occipital approaches, central midline occipital, and you come to the, four, to the floor of the fourth ventricle. Or you can go and look into the aqueduct. So you can actually reach lesions in the midbrain, whether in the tictal plate or in the tegmentum of the midbrain. It's called tillovelar approach. This is um, septal. This is easy because it's presenting to the surface. You see the discoloration, you open over it, and it's finished. Tillovelar, you want to go through the aqueduct. You can go retrosigmoid, transfer sinus, sigmoid sinus, you track the cerebellum, you get into this angle here, and then you can, <coughs> so you come this way and then you go this way. The so-called far lateral approach, which is rarely used, it's uh, very laborious. And we come now to the case of presentation of today, which I will uh, run through. <coughs> My first introduction to Cavernomas were this, 1986, I was still resident, registrar in England, at Morley Hospital, St. George's University in London, and my boss asked me to present these, uh, these cases. This is my boss then, Sean O'Leary, and we called it surgical treatment of cryptic AVMs. Why cryptic AVMs? Because we did not know they are called cavernomas. Cavernomas in new terminology. Cryptic, in English, and in Mahfi. Uh, <coughs> you send letters by cryptic language, مخفية. For cryptic, AVM is مخفية. We don't see it on angiogram. And we presented these uh, cases of brainstem uh, cavernomas and also spinal cavernomas. That was my first introduction to these cases. That was not my first paper in 86. That was my sixth paper as a resident. So, Let's have a quick look. What is this uh, cavernoma? Vascular malformations are two types. One with arteriovenous shunting, like AVM. There's a shunt of blood from arteries to veins. And one is without arteriovenous shunting. And we are dealing with these three types. Cavernomas, capillary telangiectasia, developmental venous anomalies. Cavernoma is just like uh, blackberry has feeders and everything, but we don't see it on angiogram. Capillary telangiectasia, like this one, is 
this time. And this, very important, DVA, developmental venous anomaly. This is developmental venous anomaly and subretentorial, and it's taking its feeders and drainage. This is the septal vein, thalamostraid veins, and this is the developmental venous anomaly. And it's called Caput Medusa. Caput Medusa is in the Greek mythology, is this goddess with so many arms and legs like this. So this is Caput Medusa. You also see it, I've seen it as a medical student in Egypt with hepatosplenomegaly to tubal hargeases. You will see Caput Medusa of veins on the, on the abdomen. Uh, yes, absolutely. And we should know whether it's draining up or down by putting your hands on both the draining areas, remove one and see whether it fills again and so on. And this is one patient of mine who came from Bahrain, 11 year old. Again, remember Cavernome is a disease of childhood. And look at him with sick nerve palsy. He's looking straight, this eye is looking straight, but this eye is deviated medially. Sick nerve is affected with this Cavernome. And DVA. It is said that there is not a single cavernoma without an associated DVA, and I agree with that. I have not seen a case of cavernoma without an associated uh, DVA, developmental venous anomaly. What is the importance of this? It makes hell of difference. If you touch this, it will end in death. Developmental venous anomalies are abnormal, so they are draining uh, things in a strange way. Damage it, it ends on death on table or later on. So it will decide your surgical approach and everything. And it's also associated with telangiectasia. Again, telangiectasia is a part of the syndrome. So our patient for today, 23 year old from Iraq, uh, he presented with increased intracranial pressure, and this was coupled with cranial nerve deficits. He had toes, tinnitus, attacks a gate and limb weakness. General examination was normal, that's him, with left oculomotor, left trochlear, left abducent, left facial. All the cranial nerves on the left side are affected. So you can tell and you can swear that he has a pontine lesion. Because this is the only way you can get these lesions. The brainstem must be pontine. Again here, the eye movements. He had also trigeminal affected. Decreased bent prick and corneal reflex are absent. And he had some mild facial weakness. And as we said, when you speak about facial weakness, you have to define the grade by House Brackman. House Brackman grading. He had cerebellar signs also. Finger nose test was abnormal. Lift uh, diazo dekinesia, rhombergism, and slurred speech. He had also pyramidal weakness. So you can see the difference and some alteration, but not important in the C, the CBC and so on. Images, very, very saddening for me, very saddening. Uh, I say, uh, how can I help this patient? It is not reaching to the surface, here or there. It's intrinsic. This is the most difficult ones. So I would hope that the patient would leave me and go to somewhere else. <laughs> he wouldn't, he'd come to Iraq for you personally. So it's not presenting here, not there. It's a big one. And not only a big one, it's also going into the brainstem. Mid brain, sorry. So here you are, these are the MRI images. And you can see the region and the sagittal. Consultations we did, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Juma is not around. This patient was a little bit diabetic. And uh, he advised that once we give steroids, then he would be in need for uh, insulin coverage. Uh, we asked the ophthalmologist, Dr. Salam Takrouri, who's not with us today, uh, and he reported mainly nothing in his uh, eyes. And we asked Dr. Hazim, Hazim is around. Uh, you did for us this angiogram. Why do we do angiogram, Hazim, for these cases? Would you like to step well, it depends. Uh, <coughs> it depends, Kevin, almost from the location. I mean, when it's inflammatory location, uh, you do angiogram mainly to define the presence of DVA, and then next is capillary telangiectasis. The difference between DVA and capillary telangiectasis is that 
capillary telangiectasia, they have <laughs> arterial blush, which is different, but they don't have arteri arterial venous shunting, which is a different entity. So capillary telangiectasia, you can see them by angioprop. Sure. Uh, uh, <coughs> for the infratentorial. Uh, for the supratentorial cavernomas, there is about 5% uh, uh, misdiagnosis of uh, partially thrombosed AVM that they present like a cavernoma. And then you do uh, cerebral uh, angiogram. Beside, beside to define the uh, DVE, but DVEs are more uh, uh, crucial and more important in the infratentorial uh, because of the easiness of venous infarction if you if you occlude them if, uh, or if you uh, go through them during surgery. So this is the main difference. And this is why still, uh, despite this is a topic uh, in INR uh, for the need of still of angiography, but m most most of the centers, the, the consensus is you have to do angiography for these patients. Thank you. So if you have a DVA, this, this, this must have been at birth. No, it's not. Yeah. And that's what the insurance companies look for. Cavernoma is a congenital disease. The answer is no. But you are sentenced since birth to have them. Oh, okay. It's different. So you're predisposed. You don't have them on, at birth, but sometime in your life you will have them. So you're predisposed. Absolutely. And I always put the what uh, the consultant has written so that if he changes his mind, we need face him with that. This is the angiogram. As we said, sex with an angiogram. Once you do angiogram, you did do it fully. This is a posterior fossa region. Why should I bother about carotids? You are doing angiograms, so do it fully. Two externals, two internals, two vertebrates. Not one, two. Anesthesia at that time was Dr. Jamal Sharif, and he announced patient fit for general anesthesia. I would uh, take the opportunity today uh, to ask uh, Dr. Mahavi Ababne, I asked him kindly to tell us what are the intricacies of anesthesia for the brainstorm. Mr. Mavi. Thank you very much, ma'am. Sabah khair, kun amatu khair. Thank you. Uh, thanks for trying to make uh, a very complex issue easy. Right. It's still just more complex for me now. I thought it was easier before your lecture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are talking about brainstorm, which is uh, probably the motherboard or black box of human being or they, uh, as you know brainstem death test if we declare brainstem dead that means human being is dead and uh, I thought uh, at one stage uh, me and Dr. Brahim we will, we will talk about brainstem death testing and because it's another issue it's, it's important so it's a very complex issue as, as uh, he said uh, from an aesthetic point of view probably uh, most challenging uh, uh, anesthesia uh, probably we face d during our uh, list. We've done uh, with Dr. Rahim since a long time, a long, long time, in many cases. And there are a few points to remember. Posterior fossa uh, uh, or infratentorial fossa is compact, rigid compartment with very poor compliance, which is different from the brain. And it got all beside uh, the cranial nerves, all where, where he didn't mention, all our vital science centers cardiac, respiratory, all these centers inside the brainstem of retentoria. And it is compact and uh, uh, has a very poor compliance comparing with the, with the brain tissue. And any small additional volume, trauma, hematoma, or even oedema for, for that matter sometime because of his traction, it causes a huge uh, uh, per, uh, repercussion in the uh, patient's uh, parameters. And surgery, uh, it has uh, uh, under these uh, significant challenges. Uh, it can be done in, in, in uh, pr prone position. It can be done in uh, sitting position, lateral position, uh, uh, park bench position, and uh, usually, most of the time, most of the time, Dr. Brain does it in sitting position. Some other neurosurgeons they do it in, in uh, prone position. There are advantages, disadvantages for each position, which I'm not going to mention because of the time in here, but we do it in this sort of sitting position. This is the sort of the patient during surgery with, with, the, with the legs probably at the level of the uh, feet, sorry, at the level of the head, and the patient in this situation. Uh, sitting position it's offers much better surgical access because it, it's, uh, it drains for the venous drainage, for CSF drainage, so the surgical field will be quite clear 
and visible for him and there's no congestions. But on the other hand, if uh, because of the venous pooling of the patient, especially if there is autonomic dysfunction in the aortic patient, it offers quite a challenge to keep the blood pressure there in the brain in the mean of anywhere in mercury blood pressure. And when we measure blood pressure in here all the time, we will put the transducer <coughs> to the level of the ear lobe, not to the level of the heart, because the difference between the heart and the, if the mean blood pressure at the level of the heart is 60, there will be probably 40 or less, and you will end up in, in, in ischemia of the brain stem. So we have to measure the blood pressure there where he works. <coughs> uh, patients on the sitting position must be returned to supine position rapidly for restation measures. And uh, just uh, I want to mention rapidly, how you can put this rapidly in supine, I don't know. But we have <laughs> once or twice, yeah, exactly. I, I mean, you could imagine how, how many extractors in his brain or his skull. But we have to put, unfortunately, once or twice in our lifetime back when we have problem with the patient in this uh, position. Complication of sitting position, just a few points. The cardiovascular venous pooling, as I said, in the legs. Uh, can result in significant hypertension, uh, hypertension particularly in elderly patients or diabetic patients. Surgical stimulation can result, and this is, we'll see it most of the time, hypertension, hypertension, bradycardia, tachycardia, arrhythmias, because as I said, brainstem is the, the black box of the human being, and manipulation or traction in this, can, we can see all these uh, complication. Sometimes ECG changes or blood pressure changes during surgery may indicate that the surgeon is touching one of these centers and we can tell him please uh, either to stop or uh, take the retractor sometimes before we will end up with catastrophe and disaster of these. Uh, venous uh, air embolism, this is the most common complication we see it almost, almost in every single case we see it because of, as I said, because of the setting, setting position. Potentially life-threatening complication associated with, all, with surgery in the steep head up position, and we see it there. It is incidence anywhere between 25 to 75%. It's large uh, uh, variation. Why? Because to see it clinically, you need more than 0 0.25 ml of air per kilo uh, body weight to see it clinical manifestation. So probably uh, some box mentioned probably 100% incidence of air embolism but they are clinically not significant because they are minute amount of, uh, of air. But it does uh, uh, happen in each one. Clinical feature depends, as I, say, as I said, on the rate and the volume, not, not just uh, the volume. Sorry? Rakam, to see clinical manifestation, you need 0 0.25 ml per kilo body weight to see clinical manifestation. But if it is less than that, you won't see any clinical manifestation. <coughs> Pneumoncophilus, uh, air causing mass effect in uh, elevated ICP, as I said, this is least uh, uh, compressible compartment of the brain. Using of nitrous oxide could be a problem in anesthesia because nitrous oxide diffuses to cavities and make the pneumoconfus even bigger and bigger. And sometimes we, we see it in delayed recovery, neurological deficit, headache, confusion, agitation, uh, and uh, convulsion. Best thing to do it, and we have it with Dr. Brian Miller several times, to do immediate CT and bring him back to theater and evacuate it to have better uh, problem. Macroglossia, I remember, if you remember a lady who had one case, this is catastrophic. We have done with Dr. Brian one case, and she ended up with macroglossia, and she was a, a young lady, rather young lady, and she stays like this probably for six or seven days. And you could imagine if it does happen, it is catastrophic. It is, and only in children it might impair uh, respiratory and you have to ventilate patients. In adults, it might go without ventilation. But the problem, I mean, for the family, for, it's very traumatic for the lady or even for the family to see the patient. And we have, in the span of 30 years, we had it one time. And this is probably due, due to obstruction and because of the flexion of the neck, there was no proper drainage of lymphatic or veins. But when it happens, I hate it, and I've seen it once in my lifetime. It may cause possible respiratory obstruction, as I said, particularly in children. Quadriplegia, touch wood, we never saw it. It's a rare complication, potentially disastrous because of position, we have to, to mind it. Meticulous attention to the position. By the way, to anesthetize and put the patient ready for him in this position probably needs hour, hour and a half. 
if you want to make safe surgery afterwards, safe recovery, and for the patient to go home or to intensive care rightly. You need hour and an hour and a half to put this patient in this position anesthetized. Pre-op evaluation, thorough pre as any patient should be investigated, probably with the stress uh, uh, in uh, PFOs, because if there is any uh, communication between right and left heart should be detected because of uh, uh, incidence of paradoxical air embolism. As I said, clinical manifestation of air embolism is 0.25 ml per kilogram. Unfortunately, paradoxical air embolism can happen even with one ml of air and with catastrophic disaster. Incidence is quite high. Any communication between 10 and 35 percent. So I would suggest to do an echocardiogram for all patients going in sitting position just to exclude there is any communication between right and left heart because if there is a communication and you've got a very small air coming in the system, you might end up with a disaster stroke in the brain and catastrophe and outcome of the patient and you, you won't have it. Monitoring plus routine monitoring, we need an invasive arterial line, we need central line, central line for, for both to monitor the patient uh, intake and if there is an air embolism and you see we, we've used it several times with Dr. Brahim, you can withdraw the, some air from the air embolism, especially if there is if the volume is high, you can you can use it uh, uh, to draw some air. Anesthetic technique, there is no difference between uh, uh, any anesthetic technique you, you are uh, comfortable with, just to avoid significant increase in intracranial pressure, uh, to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure, avoid hemodynamic instability and enable intraoperative neuromonitoring and ensure early detection and management of complication and any one you are comfortable with anesthetic technique is good as long as you are comfortable with it yourself. Normothermia should be maintained throughout, through all. Careful observation, blood loss, volume status of patient should be ensured at all times and this is because this is a very long surgery, usually hours. Postoperatively, extubation, it has to be smooth because it, of the surgeon or stemma, and usually we will exchange the tube with laryngeal mask afterwards. Smooth emergence extubation, it's a, it's a the goal of uh, this. Presence of cranial dysfunction and potential for aspiration woman may sometimes necessitate post-operative ventilation, and this is extremely rare. I would guess that less than, I don't know, 20%, we end up with uh, ventilation, but usually we wake them up on table immediately. Post-operative uh, uh, nausea and vomiting, it's quite common in brainstem because he operates in brainstem and there is centers in there. And usually they need some painkillers, although most of brain surgeries are not painful. This is probably the only one brain surgery is pa painful because lots of muscle and uh, dissection and manipulation. Probably some opioids to control pain after and, and, uh, these surgeries is a good advice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, but none of our patients leave the theater on a ventilator. We have to wake him up and see whether he's awake or not. Uh, as I said, the notion that send the patient to rest is not uh, medical. It's so the same stuff. I don't know if it's a real issue. Dr. Majid Alujay asked me about uh, brain stem, brain death, and uh, I can tell you we can do this next week. Uh, yes, please. Uh, on a brain stem death, it's it's. Uh, um, uh, in this country, uh, there is a lot of uh, probably abuse, misuse of brainstem death. Oh, and I tried in the Manchester Order Khasa for anesthesia resident several times uh, to do the, this talk. And I was faced uh, during my uh, career, some uh, doctors and surgeons to switch ventilators off from patients, even when there's clear exclusion criteria for brain stem death. I mean, to do brain stem death, you have to have some set of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Without even, even doing these criteria, I've been asked to, to switch off ventilator, which is, I think, needs a very, very uh, uh, good uh, to next week. Next week, for all of you, next week we'll discuss brain stem death. And the neurosurgeons who want to switch off the ventilators, we have mediocre the neurosurgeon who want to kill the patient so that his problem would die with him. Well, this is why there's a, there's a prerequisite of having two signatures yeah, uh, 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 to, to confirm 
uh, at the diagnosis. The problem, uh, mediocrity, is, is, is in no short supply. Absolutely. So having two signatures is not a difficult thing sure. to have. Sure. This is our constant form. I have talked about so many times. It has to be detailed, uh, specifying everything. And I specify that death can happen. Uh, or say, shallow paralysis. Uh, Dr. Azdak, can you a Shallow. Uh, it may be permanent. They should know this is a major surgery. They should be put in the picture. Sitting position, as Dr. Mario said. And this is a view of our theater. Microscope and everything. And we use screen and nerves monitoring. We use navigation. And there is navigation people here. Dr. Sayyid Khalid Saleh. Uh, are using his machine for navigation. It's very helpful. Like in this case. So let's see the surgery. It will take three, four minutes, and then we'll finish. So the sitting position, this is right, this is left. We have removed the occipital bone. This is right cerebellum, left cerebellum. This is the arachnoid. This is the cisterna magnum. I will just proceed like this quickly. I open the arachnoid. This is the cerebellar tonsils. Now I am at the floor, the fourth ventricle. This is the midline sulcus, which I mentioned. This is here, the facial colliculus. And there is some staining. But remember, the lesion is deep. It's not presenting to the surface. So should I open at the site of the staining? The answer is no, because this may not be the site of the lesion. So this is what I'm showing to the residents in the room. This is midline sulcus, the stramidalaris. This is the staining, but it is not overlying the lesion. The lesion is actually more lateral. So what do I do? I use the navigation to make sure that I'm in the right spot. Look at the staining there, and the region is here. So we don't go by staining, we go by proper anatomy knowledge. I know it is there, so I open a small opening. Again, it is lateral to the facial colliculus. I'm avoiding the facial nerve, and, the, and this is the region. This is the blood of the cavernoma. It's not enough to evacuate the blood. Some people just evacuate the blood. No, we have to remove the lesion. Was it clotted or was it? It depends on the stage. If it is early, it's liquid. It's late, it is solid. So we remove the, the blood. But as I said, this is not enough. We have to go for the lesion. And this is the clot. I'm not after the clot, I'm after the lesion. <coughs> You identify the feeding artery? Yes, you go around it and, uh, and coagulate it, of course. Otherwise, it will bleed again. It's like, a, it's like an AVM, but you don't see the, the feeders on angiogram. That's why it's called cryptic. So you are inside the pons. You are operating inside the pons. And your all parameters are going well. Dr. Mario is telling me, go ahead, there's no problem. Or stop. There is cardiac arrest, so I stop, or stop, I have air embolism, I have to stop, and then he will, will put the table backwards so that the head of the patient will go back. There is not a case of sitting position without air embolism, because it happens when you open the skin on the muscles. The idea is to discover it and to treat it. So we go into uh, very important points of making sure that there is no bleeding this is the legion. Still there is a legion. Here it is. Here it is. So you have to do it under the microscope. And you would wonder how a neurosurgeon is still, the mediocre one, still doing it without microscope. They say I will do it with my goggles. The ones who use the microscope, they have poor vision. You have poor vision. We don't have poor vision. The microscope is needed to, for coloration, for magnification, for everything. So any neurosurgeon who does not use the microscope belongs to the Middle Ages. Yeah. So I'm trying to remove the last bit of the tumor here is a feeder. I want to make sure that I take out.
strange that Peter did not uh, have the hemorrhage as you expected. Because it's uh, because it's tiny. Mm -hmm. yes, that's why it doesn't appear on the MRI, on the uh, angiogram, because it's tiny little bit. But you can actually see them. Make sure that we have removed it completely. I will, I will stop only when I see this, the normal color of the brainstem. That's it. So I know I have removed it completely. And then we do hemostasis. This is surgery cell inside, hemostatic agent. So here you are. This is the midline sulcus. This is the facial colliculus here. I have not touched the facial or the, and we have done it through a safe entry zone, though it was an intrinsic uh, kind of lesion. And this is the pica, this pica. And then you just go out, okay. As a pathology, Dr. Farsa. Can you do this quickly? I know it's too late. Uh, you can see this is uh, the capernoma, and this is typical uh, communicating channels. It's not single channels, communicating channels. And this uh, fibroblastic proliferation in the wall, this is very abnormal wall. Uh, again, you can see uh, they are communicating channels of abnormal walls. And uh, many cavernomas, they have hyperchromatic uh, lining of endothelial cells. Uh, if you are not experienced, you may call this uh, angiosarcoma or something, but you have to be accommodated to call these things. And many cavernomas, they have thrombi in them. And this is very important. And I wonder in the clinical course, when a thrombi form in cavernoma, does this change the clinical course or the patient will present or not? I think, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, you find uh, clotting in uh, many of them. Uh, and you can see how these are arborizing or communicating channels. Uh, and some of them are very near the surface that you are afraid that with some of them will rupture. Again, and the other things that I wonder whether the, some bleeding inside the bleeding, so you see homocytorin uh, macrophages, because this indicates that there is bleeding extra to the uh, communicating blood vessels. Uh, uh, and this again, you can see how the th wall are thin and filled with the blood. Uh, this I just want to show you this cautery mark sometimes. Uh, if this is the only thing that we have in pathology, sometimes we will have difficulty. But uh, Dr. Ibrahim knows that we have to submit uh, tissue without cautery mark. And this is brain tissue uh, adjacent to the cavernoma. Uh, 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 again, you can see the, how, how the cells sometimes can be hyperchromatic hopnail appearance, typical of uh, cavernomas. This is a stain CD31 and endothelial stain. You, you can see how they mark them very well. You can rasam rasam them, staining this stain the endothelial cells. Uh, this is CD34, another stain for uh, endothelial cells and stains other things. We use, we use them for different purposes. Uh, this is actin. You, it show you how the blood vessels are very thin, uh, they don't have the smooth muscle typical that we see see in large blood vessels. And this is JFAB that you can see that the capernoma is inside or near the uh, brain tissue or glial tissue. Uh, key 6, 7 usually is as expected is usual less than 1%. So this is a benign lesion uh, capernoma. Thank you. What's up, Dr. Marai? The very next day, not after a few months, Next morning, you can see where we were. No complications. Why do we do this? For the benefit of the patient, for the benefit of ourselves, for confidence, for trust in the uh, residents that should know what we are doing. Not to hide. You don't need, and you know always that at the end of surgery, Dr. Maria knows, we wheel the patient out and we meet the family speak to the patient, make sure that the patient is doing well, and we'll give them the tape of surgery. It's a sign of confidence. We're not hiding anything. Again, post-operative MRI. And this is the discharge summary. The length is the discharge summary that we always mention. 
And this is a photo he sent to me from Iraq. He's back to work in his father's station, that is the printer station, and he's doing well. With this we finish, and if there is any question, please ask. <laughs> any questions? Yeah, comment on the radiology. I think uh, diffusion weighted is very important, but also, Dr. Ahmed, he knows better that susceptibility weighted images, they are much, much more important because it's more sensitive to the oxyhemoglobin, yes? And you can detect uh, multiple. To mind you, cavernomas, they can be multiple in at least 25% of cases. Especially after radiation. Uh, that's excluding the familial cavernomas. So it's uh, very important to have this kind of imaging. It's even more important than the uh, diffusion weighted imaging, the susceptibility uh, weighted it imaging. Could, 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 uh, this is very uh, important. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's much, much more sensitive for multiple. So uh, m uh, to, to keep in your mind that they can be multiple uh, often. And the, the other important thing is really the uh, assurance of complete resection of that thing because they can recur and they care, they recur highly if you leave part of it. They don't recur. So, so they, 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 they repeat, they repeat, so they repeat and they recur. So, so, uh, this is very, very repeat. important, the difference between recurrence and no surgery that has been done. Can you please elaborate on spectrography? <laughs> I, I think, I think Ahmad can elaborate more. It's, it's a sort of, uh, um, uh, 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 diffusion weighted imaging with, uh, with motor and sensory uh, stimulation and having the uh, tracts, uh, uh, the, the difference in diffusion uh, uh, in, in, during the sensory or motor uh, activation, and then you can image that. But I think a man can elaborate on this. difference between diffusion in one side, one direction, and the interactography in three dimensions. You can do it in three dimensions. So you can see how the academic will have. In three dimension, you can see it. For ten, you show the tract. They can't enter with the upper, lower, or the tract. For all, one has a color certain. And in turn, you can see the tract. But I think they need simulation. All I mean to do this. The tensor imaging. This is software. Software. No simulation. The other thing is the simulation that we have functional MRI. Functional MRI. We have it in King Hussein Medical Center. It's different completely. But here it depends on diffusion. It's almost diffusion, but in three dimensions. It's not in one dimension. So for the benefit of the audience, functional MRI, MRI you do, and then you ask the patient to do this, and then you will see the activity in the motor strip. Or to show him a photo, and you see activity in the occipital lobe. This is different from tractography, which you need for uh, surgery. Uh, Dr. Jabir, I want to ask you, do you see such legions in the pediatric practice because it's common in of course we see that and uh, i'm very happy that i made it today to be able to learn a lot from you we see that and we should refer her to the right person once we see that but i i noticed that you uh, really had the reference about children's uh, uh, journal about the complications of uh, surgery yes Yes, we do see. You. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say that optangliomas and pediatrics are very different than those from others. This is in general regarding brainstem lesions. Uh, have you ever operated in, uh, on a brainstem lesion that patient presented with locked in? Well, yes, I did. And it was. Uh, a glioma? It was a, it was a bleeding area. Mainly locked in syndromes. I've seen it in ruptured uh, pontine or brainstem AVMs. And he walk up? Usually they don't. They, you just want to hold the disease, but usually mm -hmm. they don't respond. Once they go into locked in, I have not seen patients coming out. Thanks. Have you? Uh, I mean, have you seen patients stroke, coming out uh, from blocked in? No, no, from a stroke. Yes, rather than sure. Uh, from, but I was interested in uh, in, uh, in the lesions no. and the nurses. Sure. Have you seen lymphomas presenting as brainstem lesions? Yes, we have seen it. If you remember the case in 
Yeah. About five months ago, the Actually, Iraqi girl with multiple brain stem. And the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm having this is another uh, differential that would be completely, or the, or the tumor one left completely uh, uh, masked by, by steroids and then radiotherapy. Yeah, sure. And these patients, some of them would have been denied uh, therapy that would have affected them. Uh, uh, thank you all, and next week, Dr. Maui and I will be presenting brain stem death, which is a very, very important critical issue. So be there. Thank you very much.